go ahead and get us started here. Okay. And uh, good morning. Good morning. Brandon Holt. I'm uh, Dr. Rationese Candy Tate. I am the historian for the Atlanta branch of the Association for the Study of African American Life and History. That's a SALA. Right. We're here today, Friday, April 28th, 2017, at the Atlanta History Center. So, again, thank you for coming in. Yeah, thank you for inviting me. And if you'll um, share with us your name. Uh, my name is uh, Reverend Thomas uh, L. Holt. Okay. And when and where were you born? I was born in on, at Atlanta, Georgia, uh, October the 9th, 1942, at Grady Memorial Hospital here in Atlanta. Grady Baby. Yes. Uh, who were your parents, and what were their occupations? Uh, my mother, uh, at the time she worked for the uh, Jelly Coal Company they had here in Atlanta, and my father, he was in the Navy. And what were their names? Uh, Ollie and Geraldine. Holt? Yes. Okay, Ollie and Geraldine Holt. And do you have, are they from here, in, from Atlanta? As yes, well? my mother and father, both from Atlanta. Okay. And do you have siblings? Uh, I have sisters. Well, I have a sister living now. I have a f four others that are deceased. Okay. Can you um, share with us their names, genders, and if any of them were in the military? Uh, my sister, older sister, still living. She worked for Greater Hospital uh, for 42 years. She just retired three years ago. Her name? Her name is uh, Priscilla. Okay. And my other sister that are deceased is uh, Patricia. And I had two other brothers, Joe and Calvin. And, and were had, any of them in? None of them was a, a military. Okay, and where were you in the birth order? Uh, I was the oldest. Okay. I'm the oldest. So you were older than the? All the rest of them. Uh, yes. Okay, I'm a, I'm a firstborn as well. All right. And so none of them were in the military. Um, but what did you do before you entered the service? Well, I was, a, uh, I was in high school. And also, I used to work uh, kind of part time at Richardson Davidson Packing Company here in Atlanta. And also, I played basketball in, in high school, football, and baseball. In okay. what high school? I went to Luther Justin Price High School. Okay. Yes. Okay. Um, my grandfather taught there. Oh. Did you know uh, Ted Johnson, Theodore Winston Johnson? I, I think he probably came there after I, after I finished in 61. Okay. Be woodshop. Yes. Okay. okay. Well, as they say, small world. Yes. Um, in your early days, so you worked at the department store? Yes. Um, Davidson and, and uh, Riches, which is Macy's now. Okay. Yes. Right. And what made you look at the military and what branch of the military did you serve in? Well, Reen, I looked at the military because during 61, just prior to finishing high school, the Vietnam era was, was, was summoning up, and also they had the uh, Laos and the Cuban crisis, and they was getting ready to start drafting. So I decided to not to, to be drafted, and I was going to try to go to college, play basketball, and I just, just all of a sudden, I just changed my mind and just decided to go into the Navy. Okay. And Navy appealed to you for some well, particular reason? Well, the Navy, at first I was going to go into the Air Force. And upon going through the recruiting center down here on Ponce de Leon, the Air Force was, uh, at that time, the quarter was full, and I had to wait 90 days, so I didn't want to wait 90 days. So they gave me an option uh, that I could leave right away and go, and go in the Navy or the Marines. So they flipped the coin, and I flipped it for the Navy. <laughs> so were, were Navy hands or tails? <laughs> well, tails. <laughs> <laughs> um, and you already told me you enlisted, so yes. you weren't drafted. And was there a specific um, reason for choosing? Well, as, uh, after, after flipping the car, they gave me the choice of uh, entering the Navy. Uh, it was a great idea. I got a chance to see the war and also got a chance to get a, a, great, a great occupation. Mm -hmm. where, and you mentioned Ponce de Leon. So where was the recruiting office it, on, on Ponce? It's, it's where, the, the old, uh, city, where the city hall is now. The, that's 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 where the, the uh, induction center. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's where the Atlanta City Hall okay. annex is at okay. now. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. So now, when you went off to training, you know those early days of basic training. Where did you go? And tell us a little bit about leaving home and going there. Well, I, I left home uh, in, in September. After uh, I finished high school in June, so 
I left uh, got, uh, uh, left left Atlanta uh, in September. I think September the ninth or September the first, and went to uh, still choosing Great Lakes, which was going to be cold during that time. I decided to go to San Diego, California, the Navy, the Navy training center in San Diego, California. So tell me about the early training, or what was different be between Atlanta and was this your first time in San Diego? Yes, my first time. Mm -hmm. That's my first time really leaving Atlanta, going any major place just out of the, the uh, metro areas outside of Atlanta. And it was a great experience. I got a chance to meet a lot of people of all nationalities and different cultures and all that. So, and also the training was a great experience because it gave me a lot of discipline, and I got a chance to. Uh, to, to meet, meet, meet people and that was on different cultural backgrounds and uh, got a chance to uh, get into a bit to be an aircraft mechanic. Okay. That's what doing the classification, eh? That's how they classified me to be in aviation as an aircraft mechanic. Okay. Now, do you recall any instructors, anyone in particular stand out in your basic training? Well, I, I, will, I will have to give uh, my credit to my uh, commander, uh, my, my uh, that we call him Bajan, our Bajan commander. His name was uh, Chief Warrant Officer uh, Graham. Uh, he really uh, uh, gave us a, a real good indoctrination of what Navy life was about and, and what to expect as being a sailor. And, uh, and, 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 and listen to, to him and Chief Warrant Officer Drennan, that kind of inspired me more to, to be, want to be in the Navy. And, and, t and share with us what were some of those Things that they instilled in you. Well, they instilled in me the uh, most important thing: how to, how to, how to uh, really uh, adapt responsibilities, and how to the, uh, how to achieve the goals that I want to set in life. And uh, the uh, other thing is about the uh, the thing they that we had to train for: how to swim, how to survive, and how to uh, in, if we had to engage in any kind of war, if we had to. Uh, experience mustard gas or firefighting and all that. We had all that training there for us. Now, did you know how to swim? Uh, no, nah, I wasn't a great swimmer. So I went to swimming school for a couple of weeks. The Navy is, is different. They they don't want you to try to swim a, uh, uh, swim a mile. You got to be able to just get about 50 yards or 100 yards away from the ship if you happen to fall overboard or get knocked overboard. And yet the only way they survive us to do is uh, to float. And so you had to stay afloat for a certain at the time that way you could be saved if uh, if that happened. And you probably tried not to get too close to the edge of the ship. <laughs> well, it's you know what well, like I said we're working on aircrafts and and the, 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 during that time I was, we were working on jet aircraft and they had jet blasts that would after the plane run, torn up and the pilot had to leave, deploy and leave uh, the jet blast you could get caught in a jet blast that would, yeah, would blow you and knock you and knock you over. And that, that was one of the things why they stressed you in, in boot camp, how to survive. Now, um, living in a ship or having to, were you on, on land? On Most of the time, my, my, my career in the Navy uh, uh, was, uh, I was, a, I was, a, I was a aboard the Navy Air Station at, 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 at Maryland, uh, California. And... Uh, my squadron, VA-126, and uh, what, our, what our mission was to, to, for instrument training, to train our pilots to do instrument tr uh, training, that's a, a, the, for night flying, visual flying. And uh, we had a, uh, we call it, they had a F-9 aircraft, and uh, that's what I was tr trained to, uh, to, uh, to work on and, and, and uh, to accomplish, the, the, to keep the plane safe where the pilots could fly and all. Mm -hmm. Now, did you um, have to take Test or how did you get to work? Well, they they sent us to school. We had to go to school in Middleton, Tennessee, uh, Memphis, what we called it, and that was a uh, uh, it was a, a AD school, uh, aircraft jet engine mechanic school, and it was a it was an, a, a a three a three month school, and you had the the wash hour rate was real high at that time. And Why was that? Because they that the, the minutes of test they give you constantly, mm -hmm. you you had to you had to pass a certain amount of them to uh, to stay in school. And that's that's that was that's how that that you had to qualify, and you had to still still stay on your p's and q's at all time. You know you had to listen and and take notes and things like that to keep those, to pass those tests. Right. And thinking back on it now, why was that why was that important? 
Well, I, uh, during that time, uh, going through school, through the Navy school, and uh, being a judging aircraft mechanic, and when I was coming up, I always want, want, uh, I thought of aircraft, you know. I uh, had an uncle, he worked for Delta, but he like he worked something like a porter at Delta at that time, and he carries down to the airport and which to watch the, the DC-3s and things that, that fly, they, that's what they flew back in the day, the reserve type planes. Mm -hmm. And for me to be in the Navy and work on million dollar type aircraft, that was a great, a great aspiration in my life, to, to have that opportunity. Right. Yes, at that time. And you didn't want to mess up? Well, you couldn't. It, it, was, it was no, it was no uh, excuse for error. It wasn't a waste for error at that time. That's why you had to do everything right at, the, at, at that time. Wonderful. So now, um, tell me a little bit about military life. You know, did you have to go through the physical, physical training? Oh. We talked about swimming. But yes. We uh, well, yeah, we, we had other training that uh, the Navy requires to do. We had to go through the uh, uh, rifle range to shoot. Uh, we had to, uh, to shoot the M1 rifle, uh, and we also had to do the Colt 45 pistol. Uh, that's what the Navy carried on shore patrol, and we had to, we had to learn, know how to handle the, the safety aspects of the uh, rifle and the uh, and the uh, uh, Colt 45 pistol. Now, were there um, barracks and? Oh yes, we had we had we had back during that day in the 60s. It was a we had open bay barracks where they set up about 60 uh, cellars in in one cube. Mm -hmm. And watch your microphone. Your um your jacket when you cross your hands. Oh, oh yes. It, it, it rubs the mic. Okay. So you just kind of keep them, All right. keep them here. But you're, you're good. Okay. Um, and then kind of tell me a little bit about the food and the social life. Yeah. You were, how long were you there and how did you? Well, I was, I was, I was at Marymount for a practice of 28 months. Uh, the food was real. We had one of the best chow halls that uh, the, they said the Navy had on the West Coast. So we had real good food. Barry life was living living among a bunch of other guys. I hadn't had a chance to do it. It got to you got to get adapted to that, and they had to adapt to you. So everybody had to. Well, the thing about the navy, they just you you take care of your clothing and and stuff like that. They wash your own clothes. You had to keep them. Uh, back, uh, well, they had a, they call a bag uh, a lock inspector inspection, and you had to keep everything neat at all times because you didn't ever know when the CO might come through and call on a bag for inspection. And I can see how clean cut and how well dressed you are today. So I know you passed those inspections. Oh yes, but, but was there someone else who who didn't? And what happened if if oh, you didn't pass? Well, if you didn't pass the inspection, they they had what they call uh, they put you on a uh, show duty, and you had the uh, uh, sometimes they would give you a fifteen day uh, period that you had to uh, pick up cigarette butts, or you either had to shine brass on doors and stuff like that, and that that kind of got people's uh, attention. It was straighten them out. Yeah, straighten them out real quick, right. How was it um, being an African American? Well, it was kind of different because there wasn't that many else uh, that was in the Navy in certain areas, but we was kind of scattered out back in the 60s. Very many free blacks, I guess, didn't try to come in the Navy because I guess of the swim. You had to, they know you had to go aboard a ship, you'll be away from your family, and it was, a, it's a, it, the sea life is a, it's a, it's a different life. It's totally different. How so? Yeah, because you know you away from your family, and then you you thousand thousand miles from no land, and you got to be able to be able to survive and and and, and get adjusted to that, and it's totally different. Right. Um, now I'm going to go into wartime. Now you said you were. We was during the Cuban crisis. We we was matter of fact, my squadron. I just had completed uh, basic training when I uh, when I first came to uh, NES Marymount and BR and VA one twenty six. And I guess it was about two or three months. That's when uh, uh, when President Kennedy was in was in office, and uh, the uh, Cubans was going to get the missiles of Russia to send the missiles to Cuba, and so we was on alert uh, that night in case we would need for other forces to uh, to sustain uh, uh, the the Cuban uh, the missiles from uh, being sent to Cuba. And do you remember what year? That was in 1962. 1962, I think it was January of 1962, when all, when all that happened. But now, at that point, so there's a tension in the air, but you're still U.S., on the U.S. side. Yes. You're not going... Well, like I said, we was at the base, and we was on alert. Once we called on alert, we on, we on 
we can't go anywhere for for, for 48 hours. We are, you know, we're, we're like quarantined there. We're, we're, we're there until further notice. Kind of on the ready. We're on the ready. So, yeah, we see bags are packed, all the armament with that. We, our squad to need the planes was all ready, so we was we were ready to deploy. We just waiting on the word. And so. And how does all that work? So then you have Navy and deploying, but you're working with another branch. Oh, we had all we had, you know, like I said, the Marines and the Navy. All we work worked together uh, to to comfort the mission. That's 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 the part of the Armed Forces. All branch all branches of the military work together to to, to, to com complete uh, to complete one to complete the goal. And this question about the front line, so did, did anything transpire or? Well, at the last minute, they, it was called off. They turned the ships around and they uh, headed back. So then it, 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 at that time, we were still uh, on, 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 uh, on alert uh, for at least about three more weeks until that happened. Um, so we turned the ships around, but kind of walk us through getting the ships ready and getting them out and then your part, what part you played? Well, my, our part was to us to really to have all our clothing, our sea bags packed, and make sure that I was, uh, our plane was ready and that uh, we had all our equipment that we needed because we had to keep a, a inventory on everything that we had to carry with us at that time. So we kept that up. That was, a, that was an everyday thing that we did. You know, we did inventories on what we had and supplies that we had to replenish if they was, was used up. And we stayed 100% availability. Gotcha. Yes. What was it um, like? So you were a mechanic, and what, were you in close contact with the pilots who actually flew, or what was that? Well, I was. I was. I was. I was com com with the with the pilots. You know, we was a one on one. Each of us was assigned to, to to a plane, and we had the pilot. You know, we was we was real close because we we uh, I was the plane captain of of, of his uh, uh, aircraft. And I ensured that everything was safe and ready to go at all times. And we talked about, you know, general things and family and stuff like that. And but we, you were the leader of, you said you were the captain. I was the plane captain. Each, each, each just, we, a plane captain is, is we, we control uh, the aircraft itself. Uh, we had the F-9, F-18 uh, jet aircraft. And we had to make sure everything uh, that was operational on that aircraft at all times, uh, from the cockpit all down through the, the landing gear, the tires, and, and the engines, and all that was was our part. So we had to we had to do a daily inspection every morning uh, before the pilot came out and make sure that everything was ready. So his life was in your hands. Well, yeah, that's 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 where it is. We we depend on each other, okay. you know. So we had to have that bond with one another at all times. Um, this ask it, did you witness any casualties or destruction? Well, we had uh, we had a couple of incidents that happened. Uh, we had a couple of, uh, of pilots that was that was a, a, st a station at Marymount from other squadrons went went on other other ships, and a couple of them uh, we heard they got uh, didn't make it. They, you know, they was doing carrier uh, uh, qualification. The pilots, you know, they come in just like regular people, but uh, 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 work, work, landing on an aircraft carrier is different from landing on a on a on a, on a, uh, a, a runway. And a it's a moving target. You know, it's a, it takes a lot of experience for those pilots to get adjusted to that. You know, that that uh, ship moving and they're, they're trying to land and come to the same thing that they, they do on a runway. And it's very difficult at night. Night is the is the worst part, the division part of it. And it takes skill and accuracy and all, you know. But uh, like I said, we, that's what we're trained to do. And was there a special reason for flying at night? Well, they, they yeah, they had to fly at night there in case it would be the enemy attacked at night. So you have to have you have to be able to do everything day or night at all times. And so you mentioned the you know the ships were sent out, and kind of kind of how did that how did you feel this? you know, this potential of going to war, or how did others, what was the atmosphere like? Well, like I said, I was young then, I was around about, I just, I guess, just turned 19 after going through boot camp and coming back to the, to the, to the carrier, uh, to, to my squadron. And, 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 and all the other younger guys, they was just like I was, you know, they was excited, you know, and eventually they wanted, this is something, they wanted to challenge, because we didn't think we would be put in that kind of position, 
you know, to do this. And it was a gave you great, great responsibility, and, uh, and uh, it, it, it showed you that, that how, how, how much you was well depended upon, you know, for each other. So you were like 19, 20 years old? Uh, I, was, I, was, I, was, I, was, I was 19. Captain. Yeah, yeah. That was a great experience for me to accept that kind of responsibility, mm -hmm. you know, being that young, you know. But the Navy, that's what the Navy is about. When they bring you in, they train you, and you just pick up what you have to do and carry it on. And is there, um, I think we talked about it a little bit, this kind of Navy mentality? Yes. Share with us what that, what that is. Well, the Navy uh, mentality, you know, like I said, we, we, uh, we, we know we have to leave our families and our loved ones and all that, at, you know, at any given time. You know, like I said, we could be downtown, you know, we could be on our liberty, what we call it, uh, going downtown to maybe go out and eat, uh, either go to a, a, a dance or something like that. And, and I guess you've seen some of the movies how that doing they had the uh, when Pearl Harbor and all that was the was attacked and how they was caught off guard. So we they they p prepared us for for stuff like that. You know, if that had ever happened while we was away from from the base, and that if we was called upon, how we had to we know what we had to go and we know what we had to do. We had to stay ready at all the time. And were you in touch with your family and friends back home? Well, I wrote my my grandmother uh, um, just about maybe every uh, two weeks, and we received mail, you know, correspondence. And I had a chance to call about twice a month, and uh, for communication, she so let me know how things was in Atlanta, and I let her know how things where I was at. So, what was this special connection with grandma? And what, yeah. What's her name? My grandmother's name? name was Fanny. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she. My, matter of fact, my grandmother the one that really raised me. Yeah, my grandmother raised. me. Yeah, she was a uh, dealer to me a whole lot. Mm -hmm. Yes. And this is mother's mom or well, my, my mother, my mother. mother's mother's Your mom. Maternal. Yes. Uh -huh. And what was her last name? Uh, Hurd. So Miss Fanny Hurd. Yes, Fanny okay. Hurd. Yes. And you you said she raised you. Was yes. There's some special. Well, because you know, like I, I guess you know, since I was the oldest, and and uh, I was, I guess, uh, for my mother had others. My mother remarried when I was nine years old. And that's why I had my other siblings, my other brothers, uh, Joe and Calvin, and then my other two sisters, Priscilla and Patricia, okay. that was born. And my daddy's mother also, she was a great aspect to me. She, she kind of helped raise me too. And so these letters, what were they, what would you share with her and what would she write back to you? Well, I'll just tell her how things was in California, how the weather was and the condition and, and how I, I was doing, uh, going to school. I was, I was going to school also while I was in the Navy, so I was telling about I had got in, in a college and I was, you know, starting to, to be, uh, in, I was in uh, uh, criminology and, and, uh, and uh, trying to uh, be uh, a, a police, a policeman, and I was just telling how that was going. My training outside the Navy, I was preparing for another job because I really didn't know what to expect when I, you know, got out of the military life. So I would just write and tell her how school was going, how I was doing. And, the people that I met and I worked with and all, and, and she was in, because I wanted her to come to California. She had never been anywhere, but I never did get, get her to come to California. Yeah. Okay. Yes. And what would she share with you in her letter? Uh, she, well, she would just tell me how things was in Atlanta, how my uncles and my, my aunts and all was, and how they was asking about me and how they thought about going to come and see me and all that at the time. And uh, this, this kept me abreast of what was going on here in Atlanta, you know. Uh, as well as I kept them abreast of what was going on in California and the Navy career. So it made, made you feel like you were... Uh, well, I had that good, good, good contact bond. Good. Yes. Good, good, good. And you mentioned going off base and going into the city. So what was... I know you mentioned you got to meet lots of nationalities. So again, this is... You know, we know the height of the Civil Rights Movement is kind of 68, 69. Oh, yes. But what's happening... 61, 62, what, what is well, doing race that, relations? Like? Race relations is good, but they had, during that uh, time, you know, they had, uh, I think, uh, Anya Davis, and they had the Black Panthers, and all of that organization. They were, most of they was up in the Northern California, Berkeley and Oakland. And, you know, we, we couldn't participate in nothing like that because the military, you know, they wouldn't let us participate in any kind of uh, activities, you know, uh, and civic stuff like that because we were military. But I would hear the news and stuff like that. That's how I kept a, kept abreast myself, you know. And uh, I just I just know the outside the outside uh, 
outside outside was told different from the military because we didn't really uh, get a chance to hear much unless we watched the news on TV, and we weren't allowed to go out and demonstrate and stuff like that. But we know things was uh, was happening and it was happening for the best of the country. You know, Dr. King was our great you know inspiration to getting the civil rights going and started because. When I was here in Atlanta, you know, all school was desegregated and all. You know, we had to go to what they call white fountains and, and black fountains and they all were that. Segregated. Segregated, yes. That's all that was segregated. So, Dr. King era, it, it was a great deal helping out. And also, it, it, it started helping out in the military because the military was segregated too. There was a lot of things going on in the military that, that people really didn't know, you know, until, until, they, until you, 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 know, you was in there with it, you know, because things. Things were magnified, you know, uh, thing, like I said, in the South, we know how segregated it was, but in the military, it was totally separate because they had the UCMJ uh, to, uh, to, 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 to judge that, and you couldn't break those laws that the uh, military had on the Uniform Code of Military Justice. And, you know, we had a lot of, I guess, our commanders and stuff like that. So a lot of them from Mississippi and, and Alabama and states like that. And they, at that time, they was kind of still had a lot of hatred and stuff like that. Because we, I heard a lot of other shipmates said that their captains was kind of prejudiced toward them, you know, and race relation and all like that. Because you, you mentioned Rev, um, Chief Officer Graham. Now, where was he? Do you remember where he was from? Or uh, was he black, white? No, he was he was Caucasian. He was white, uh, and uh, he was a uh, uh, he had been in the military for twenty some uh, twenty some twenty three or twenty four years. And I think he was going to try to make 30 years, but I guess it's about being in the military and being around all different nationalities. I guess it kind of changed him a little bit too, because I seen a lot of a lot of people at that time from the deep south, you know, and 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 uh, had a chance to to really sit down and get a chance to know one another and and, and have that bond with one another. We came we came close, you know, and a lot of that uh, uh, segregation that was there, we started people started to integrate more in the military. They started knowing more about one another you know, on, on a one-on-one -on -one type basis. Because I think a lot of the discrimination came from the families, you know, that what you grew up with, you know, and how they taught hatred and all that kind of stuff. What they would perpetuate. Yes, yes. And it's like kind of a lack of knowledge. Right, lack of knowledge and understanding, that's it. So when you're in close quarters with each other, say oh. that you... All that, all that, uh, all of that, you know, it, it just went away. You know, after, after a while, we got to know each other, got adjusted each other life and how to, how each other culture was and all that. And we respect that, you know, we, we respect that. So now you said you were in college, what, what school? I went you? to San Diego Junior College, yes. And then so did you um, kind of tell me, you know, when you, it, it has coming home or leaving the military, Tell me about well, I, I attended afternoon cl uh, classes, uh, you know, after work. They had a, a, a bus that would come to the base and pick us up and carry us uh, downtown. And so that's how I got a chance to, I used to go, go to school three days a week. And uh, the bus would come out and pick us up. At, 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 we got off at four o'clock, the bus would pick us up at five. And we were gone from five until 10 at night. And uh, going, going to school was another good, at, uh, good, good, Good outlook on my of my life too, because I got a chance to meet some of the people in the city, you know, and uh, that uh, was doing different things, studying different subjects and stuff like that. Okay. And so, because I see here you were also in Marietta, so you were at Dobbins. I was at uh, Dobbins, yes. So you got to get me from California to Dobbins, and you 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 met your sweetheart, you married so. Share with me a little bit more of your life. Okay, well, after, uh, after uh, uh, leaving California and coming back uh, uh, home and uh, getting a chance to join the reserve program there, uh, it was kind of different because uh, being back in Ray Rowley, it was another uh, change we had to get used to, you know, uh, 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 coming back to the squadron. And, and most of the people here in Atlanta, you know, there was a lot of young people that just coming out of high school and they was coming in, they hadn't been nowhere and they hadn't been taught. So you had to kind of get used to them. They come in, they'll, they'll say anything out of the way until they got used to what, what had to be done in the military. And uh, I got a chance to uh, train a lot of young people uh, that's right out of high school. And uh, they kind of respected me because I, I had, uh, had uh, that, you know, I had, I had gained uh, leadership ability in the Navy so well I could 
train young, 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 young individuals, you know. And uh, just generally being back here in uh, the Navy and being in California, it was, it was a total big, big change, you know, from the, from the culture of the peoples and, and understanding and all. How so? Well, like I say, you know, you, you still, it was still like when I came back here in 1964, Civil rights had really got hadn't been undocumented during that time, so we still had things issues on the base that we had in the community because everybody was still <laughs> from the community, you know. And so it was a, a lot of things we had to learn to respect each other. They just called people out of their names and stuff like that, uh, you know. But they got it straightened out. It wasn't it wasn't no problem. It was it was total. It had it had it had it, had it under control, okay. you know. But uh, it was it was a big 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 change though coming back home uh, from being out west and and other places and and the doubt with people living with each other on the base and stuff like that too in in, in Atlanta. Did you ever go out of the country? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, I, most of my time uh, uh, that I went out the country is when I when I came back to, to the reserve. Yeah, I got a chance to. We used to go to to road to Spain just about every year, and so we would go and work at Asimed. And we had to we had to fly our uh, equipment and go ahead and fly there, fly missions of others of the uh, outfits. It's from we would go to uh, Rota, Spain. We would get commitments to go to uh, Naples, Italy, and Sigonella, and also Germany, and also uh, uh, England, Mendenhall, and the Azores. We used to go have to go to the Azores and pick up stuff, supplies and things. Okay. And um, is it so. Is that where some of these medals and pictures? Well, uh, some, some, some of the, uh, these, uh, the medals and pictures, uh, they're sting from when I met other shipmates uh, in, the re in the reserve and things that, I, you know, that we did. And also I have a civilian part of the aviation part of it too, you know, working for the federal government. Mm -hmm. When I came back here to Atlanta, I was able to get a job at Lockheed Martin, work, uh, help build the C-5, work on the C-5 program. So tell us about that. How is it working? At well, that uh, building C-5, that was one of the uh, big aircraft they had, military aircraft, tra transport. And uh, I got a chance to uh, to work on the uh, the uh, f uh, flight flight uh, crew of it. And they used to fly back and forth to Palmdale, California. You know, so we used to have to fly out there and work uh, to help 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 their peoples uh, out when they needed help. And we used to have to go out there and help. Repair the C-5 when things got damaged or t uh, whatever. And but some that was like a, a, t a TDY deal for 90 days. We would go to Palmdale. But building the C-5 was a was a was a was a was a great aspect too, because coming out of A and P school in Atlanta, you know that's why I got the job uh, uh, on career day. Uh, uh, Lockheed came out and had about 30 of us out of school to uh, work on the C-5 program, and so that was a chance for me to, to develop my other skills from being in the Navy, because the Navy, I just only worked on the uh, aircraft engines and all, but uh, going to A&P a school, I had the chance to, to have all the aspects of the aircraft, you know, the sheet metal part of it, to do it, and the doping fabric, and all, all the other repairs that had to be done on the aircraft. So you came back to Atlanta, went to A&P school, and then were recruited to Lockheed. Right, I was on career day, I went to Lockheed and worked with them on the C-5 program, okay. yes. And for, what were your dates at Lockheed? My dates at Lockheed, I started in, uh, it was uh, June 1969, and I worked for that first part. I worked at Lockheed twice. I worked at Lockheed from, from 1969 through 1971 of, uh, of uh, January, January 1971. And, and you went back? Then, uh, no, after that, I was laid off. They had a, they, Lockheed laid me off, and I was able to, to get a job in May of 1971 and work for the federal government for the FAA. So I worked for the FAA from, from uh, May 10th, 1971 through, Jan through April 1994. So I spent 29 years and six months with the federal government working, working on the aircraft at, at Charlie Brown Airport here in Atlanta, yes. Yes. So tell me about that experience. Oh well, the FAA was. I was. I was. I was really enthused about getting a job with the FAA. You know about uh, working, coming out of the Navy, and 
by working at Lockheed and then uh, going through civil service and getting that job with the FAA. And uh, when I uh, went to the FAA for, for an interview, uh, 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 Mr. Uh, Irvin Tuck, he was superintendent of maintenance. And uh, he sat down and I went through my 171 and through my civil service rating. And he was asking me about my, my background experience or work. And he told me that the FAA was gonna be a, a whole lot more than what I could probably handle at that time, you know, coming in as, as young. You know, I was about, I, when I came to work for the FAA, I was 20, 22 years old. And, and most of, my, the, most of the, uh, the guys that I had to work with, they was uh, like 35 and 42 and maybe 50 some years of, of age. And they had a lot of experience. And, and I'm a young guy coming up under their wings, you know. So they taught me a lot. They, they trained me and taught me a lot. I was, they really respected me. I was one of the first blacks that uh, the mechanic that they hired. So that kind of made it stand, stood out for me, you know, that here I am, a, a young black guy from Atlanta, getting this opportunity, you know, to work for the federal government, you so know. you were paving the way for others. Yeah, yes, it yes. It seems like your Navy experience, well, that, military but, experience. Yeah, the military experience uh, paid, paid the way for me. That gave me the background, you know. And, uh, they was very, very uh, the guys, really, they was, they just took me, just took me under their wings and just welcomed me on board and, and just told me whatever I need to, didn't know that, that I need to know. They were going to, you know, uh, make sure I had the right training. Who were some of the names of some of the folks that? Well, I, I, the people that, well, Mr. Irby Tucker, he was the chief of maintenance there. And uh, my other, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Jones, uh, he was the uh, maintenance, maintenance chief. And uh, also I had uh, uh, Mr. Hugh Cooper. He was also uh, uh, my section leader. And uh, Mr. Jones, he was, a, he was a Navy chief in the Navy. So he, him and I had a good, good book the relation because we know he'd know where, what I came, where I came from and what, what training I had. Now, Mr. Cooper, he was Air Force, but he, always, he also respected you know, my training also. And I worked with uh, guys Roy Moon and Larry Patterson and, and Jane Bland. They were some of the other mechanics that I worked with, Joe Furish. And uh, they were just regular people. You know, they all was, mil everybody was military. And that was, a, that was a great deal. Everybody had been in the military and they had that, you know, military bond for working with one another. So how was, you mentioned you were one of the first, so then how was it paving the way or getting up? Yeah. Well, like I said, uh, other African Americans to well, I, I, the FAA. well, I think you know that 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 gave uh, a, that, that that set the tone for other other black guys that uh, that went to A and P school and they wanted to probably come and work with the federal government or either work for the airline because that back during that day we didn't have any black mechanics working at the airline. It was uh, it was they hadn't integrated that during that time, and uh, that's that was uh, I guess another highlight you know of, of my career. That's early 70s? Uh, uh, that was in 19, I went to the FA in 1971, mm -hmm. yes. But still back during the day, they still, their lines really wasn't hiring no black mechanics. And uh, the, the reason why they were saying that, uh, that we didn't have the training, you know, like that we had the A&P school in Atlanta, the Atlanta Air Tech just opened up in 1969. And I was one of, one of the first uh, two or three blacks that went to the A&P school in the Atlanta Air Tech. So that's history of, yes. of Area Tech and their graduates. Yes, yeah, yes. Their training program. Yes. Wonderful. Um, your wife, where, where did your wife come into the story? When did you all meet and where? And well, I've been married twice. Mm -hmm. My first wife, I, uh, the, the Jenny, she was from Mayweather. And that's like when I came back to Atlanta, I went to uh, uh, Mayweather, and I got a chance to, to get out in the, t the town. A friend of mine and I, we met two two young ladies. They was friends. and. Uh, uh, Dr. Etheridge, his, his, uh, he's of my friend, him and I came and joined the Navy Reserve in Atlanta together. So we went out to Mayweather and we just went around Lemon Street High School and all through there until we met two young ladies and we just started dating. And it escalated from that. We just, uh, we just had a bit, Chen and I decided to just get, to get married. Yep. They yeah. had children? Yes, I had, had, had two boys. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then your wife now? Uh, Betty. Yeah, my wife, uh, Betty, she's from Albany, Georgia. And my wife, she worked for the GBI. She just retired from the GBI about three years ago. Okay. Yes. And your Reverend Hope, so when... Well, I got into ministry, ministry uh, back in 1979. Uh, went to uh, 
I was I, I was born and raised as a as a as a AM, AME. I was I was I was a, in the Methodist Church. I brought up raised in the Methodist Church. The Trinity AME Church the church I, was my home church here in Atlanta. And I worked on a Dr. Coswell, uh, and also uh, I think a Dr. Williams. Uh, he was a was out in Alida for a long time. Yeah, Dr. Williams. And uh, Trinity is on Lenhurst now. And uh, I still have friends uh, that's a member of the AME churches, the Phil Potts and the Stewarts and all of them. Mm -hmm. Yes. And now you're? A Baptist. Okay. And what's your church? I'm at the Greater Solid Rock Baptist Church in uh, Riverdale, Georgia. Yeah. And uh, our pastor now is Dr. Uh, Dr. Anton Rowe. Uh, he replaced uh, Dr. Waters, John Waters. He's Pastor Merrick. He spent 35 years at uh, the Greater Solid Rock. They came, they came out of the Summer Hill area. Yes, Dr. Waters. Okay, so then your um, mechanic and Navy experience became a ministry. Yes. How so? Yes. How so? Well, like I say, I was, uh, my grandmother started me out in in the church. She made sure I went to Sunday school all the time, and it's just I just had that concept of Christ in my life, you know, everywhere I went. So, uh, and when I Changed over to the Baptist. I started working in the Baptist church. I came out of Bethany Baptist Church. That's where I started out. At. It's in the Pittsburgh area. And uh, most of my classmates, Dr. Etheridge and all of them was at, at Bethany. And uh, uh, Reverend Hicks, he was the pastor that during that area. Uh, and uh, he the one that gave me an opportunity uh, to be, uh, I used to be the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, I guess we would call the minister, the, the uh, young minister of the uh, but for, for the young peoples. Okay. Yeah, so I was the coordinator. In Pittsburgh area is close to Atlanta area. Yes, that's yeah. uh, that's that's right out of uh, uh, of uh, off of a Price Street University. Mm -hmm. uh, either uh, I guess a uh, George Avenue you were saying university in that area. And what was that neighborhood like? Well, it's uh, it's uh, during that time was a nice, but right now the Pittsburgh area is kind of run down. Uh, I think Senator Dean he's he's the uh, senator over in that area. Ju uh, Ju uh, John Julius Dean, I think he's he's I think he still has that area in Pittsburgh. But they was building rebuilding Pittsburgh up here a while back, but I think it's gonna run down again now. They're trying to uh, uh, re renovate renovate that area now. Right. But in the seventies, it was it was thriving. Yes, yes, it was. Yeah, they black had, community. it was a big black community during that time. They, they what they we used to call they had the uh, the canteen Pittsburgh area. That's where everybody used to go and dance on Thursday night. All the young people's. That's what we would go off from Price High School to Carver High and all that. We would all go to the, to the canteen to dance and stuff like that. So the canteen was, uh, where, where was it? It was, in the, it was in Pittsburgh area, right off of McDaniel. That was, that was one of the big highlights they had, that was the canteen. Yeah. Just like, I guess you said, Moser Park for the west side of, of, of Atlanta. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. See, but as a church member, were you supposed to be at the canteen? Well, like I said, you know, on Sunday, on Thursday night, I think all all kids from all ages. That's why we all had a chance to go out and and and, and uh, meet each other, you know, and have fun. Okay. Yeah, my parents, they, they, you know, they they strived that, you know, we kept everything nice and clean and didn't get into kind of trouble. They let us go. Did you get to go to theaters or was oh, there oh, a movie, yes. movie house there? Oh yes. Oh yes. We had the Carver Theater in Atlanta. We had the Ritz, the uh, Royal down on Asper Street. And I think I guess now the Lowe's is we used to be down on uh down there on uh what's that uh on Forsyth Street? Yeah, Forsyth. Mm -hmm. The Lowe's and then they had the Fox which is still there now. Right. Yes. And I'm trying to think, so the seventies it was DC because I've heard stories. Well the Fox the Fox was yeah. Kind of yeah, the, upstairs yeah, the, the Fox the area. back during back during our time coming the Fox we had to go from the side and the side uh the Fox at the end we couldn't enter the front back during the segregation uh, time, you know. And like I said, on the theaters we had, that was the, uh, we had was the, uh, the Royal Theater, which was down on Astra Street, and the Carver Theater, which was out where we had. And then they had a, I think the, uh, it was a, on Fast Street, the Buttermilk Bottom, they called over there. They, they had another theater over in that area. I don't know if you heard about those or not. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. all right. Um, mother, I'm, I'm a, a native. My mother talks about it. Okay. Um, do you recall any films that you, 
were you like into westerns? Well, I was. We we were coming up during that time. I was you know in in the, they had the Long Ranger, you know, and uh, Cisco Kid and all that, uh, Tano and and uh, I guess they had a uh, Buster Craft and movie we used to watch at the uh, theater. That was, that was the kind of the big thing. We had the Mantan Motor moving, all that that came on. Ames and Annie, you know, that was oh, the, the, the black movies and all that came up. And any, I'm wondering, were there any military or like war type movies? Well, they they had they had the they they showed the World War Two type movies. You know, things Korea and War. My uncle, and my father was in. They showed all that back then those days. So your father was a veteran. Yes. As well, what, my what father's in the Navy. Okay. Yeah, really? father's in the Navy. Uh -huh. okay. Yes. Yeah. Well, my stepfather also he was the army. He retired out of the army. He he was a medic in the army. My stepfather. Okay. So you had military. I had. I'm just from a military brat, military background. Gotcha. And then we've talked about what you've done since the military. Have I left anything out? Mm -hmm. Well, like I said, my my. my uh, my doing my ministry like that. I was the youth director at the at my church, you know, uh, in in the Pittsburgh area, and also we had the young David and Red Circle girls, where we kind of motivate them, you know, and and minister them about Christian life and and, and coming up doing different things, and uh, we had a, a basketball team and a base softball team that we go out and play at other churches, you know. So we had that bonded between the other churches, you know, like in Atlanta, Hillsboro, uh Jackson Memorial, uh, uh, Dr. Sutton, and Dr. Smith, and all those churches that we fellowship with. Wonderful. Yes. Um, were, at that time, were you all involved with the Civil Rights Movement and SCLC or King? Well, I was most with, with the SCLC and Dr. King. Mm -hmm. Yes, I sure did. Or I guess at that time it was uh, Abernathy. Abernathy, David. Was David was running, yeah, David was. Abernathy. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I guess, uh, what's his name? Uh, I just retired not too long ago. Uh, Larry, Joe, Dr. Larry. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And yes. then um, Jose Williams. Oh, yeah. Jose was a great, great turnout. Yeah. And so did your church or your ministries have any, and how were you all involved? Well, my pastor, you know, he's, he supports the SLC and all that, uh, Dr. King. And I was I was just, most of when I uh, was in my church, we we used to go and fellowship with, uh, with Dr. Morris Church, uh, over over uh, at a Philadelphia Baptist Church, and, and he had a young man named Marquis Mark Hudson. I guess you hear a lot of him now. He was at Mo House, and uh, he he did a great job. I thought we were looking for him to do a lot of a lot of good things. He's, he I think he's still going to going to come out. Yeah. Now, now, did you do any marching? Uh, I, I marched with the Civil Rights. Yeah, when Dr. King I, on his birthday, we go downtown and march with Civil Rights. Mm -hmm. They st for still I still participate in that during his birthday. Yes. And as, as I think about ML King um, Drive, any did you frequent Pascals? Or? Oh yes, yes, yes. The original Pascals. Yeah, so yeah. Well, the Hunter Street Pastors. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the original one. It's on North Side Drive now, at the at the airport, you know. But that, the original one, Pastors it was right there on Hunter Street. We call. And would you would you remember or recall about Hunter Street? Well, I about the Hunter Street. I remember the about the Rainbow Inn and that we had there. I guess you would say and. Uh, Let's see, we had the Rainbow Inn there, and they had, uh, what they had? Uh, the Rainbow Inn was a that was restaurant. A, that was a hot dog, the, the, the hot dog deal, the, okay. rain, the Rainbow Inn, yeah, that was the, the hot dog deal. And also, I think they had a, uh, they had a couple of clubs there. They had Don Clint Dinners, used to be there on, on Honda Street. And uh, so, also, we, I think Zell, I mean, uh, what's his name? Uh, uh, I know Zell Mel Zell's uh, Ali Pat and and um, and what's the name? I guess the name. I was trying to think of her name. She used to come on uh, TV uh, with uh, with Ali Pat. Uh, yeah, I can't call her name right now, but she was a great access. Her and Ali Pat during that time. Mm -hmm. They used to, they used to have they this this jockey show on at night time. Zilla Mays, that's her name. Okay. Yeah, Zilla Mays. Uh huh. Yeah. So, um, how was it? You know, how would you say the city was in maneuvering between, you know, all black neighborhoods, but trying to fight to integrate? Well, what I was think that time like for you. I think during that time, to, to me, you know, we had our unity more. Seemed like we were more unified as 
before we integrated. And 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 like I said, we didn't have to have all the all the best of things, you know, because all the schools, the high schools, they had all the all the, the better material, you know, books and things. That's how they scored high on all the at any time they, you know, we had to compete against them. They would score high because they had all the, all the, all the, the, the better education and, and the better material to, to, to work with than we did. We had the second, second grade books and things that we was taught out that our teachers taught us, and they did a good job with what they had, you know. And it was up to us to, to, uh, to, to follow and do other things to comprehend what they was, what they was giving us. And, and as a whole, to me, when we integrated, I think we lost the black unity. You know, but we had to integrate. That had to be done. That was a, a mission that Dr. King had to com accomplish, you know, to, to integrate. But seeing like when that happened, we lost out ourselves. We let a lot of things down, you know, as, uh, as black people. And uh, I guess that's some things you have to give up to, to get, you know. But as a whole, I think it's, it's coming back. Uh, our kids are getting, uh, getting more education, you know, getting educa educated a lot more. And they, you know, are getting a chance to experience a lot of to be around, you know, and, and, and the competition now, I see if where the, that the black kids and, and have to deal with the, with the Hispanics and, and, and the Mexicans and all that. So that's another choice, you know. And as of a whole, you know, I think that the majority now it's not blacks that got to do Hispanics and the Mexican and, 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 and all the Hispanic people, they come a part of this too, you know. Definitely. Yes. Yeah. Um, and I was going to ask you if we could We've got some closing reflection questions, but I, I met you at the Atlanta chapter of yes. the Tuskegee Airmen. So how, tell me how you, you know, you got involved. Well, I have a friend of mine, uh, his name was uh, Don Solomon. Him and I worked for the FAA, and I was, uh, he was at the Golden Corral up here on the East West Connect. His wife and him was, uh, was eating, and I was getting ready to go to Lockheed. I just stopped by to pick up something to eat. And I asked him, I said, what are you doing? And he said, well, I'm, I'm working with the, with the Tuskegee Airmen. I said, well, I said, yeah, I heard of them. I said, well, they are op well, they're located. And they, at that time, we was located at Delta Airline out on um, Virginia Avenue. That's where we were meeting at, in one of their conference rooms. And I said, well, I said, they still taking memberships? He said, yeah. He said, why don't you come by and join us? And uh, uh, on a sa we meet every second Saturday of the month. So I just went and taking this uh, advice and got a chance to, at that time, uh, Drew, Drew Feller was our president before JT taken over, and uh, this was back in uh, 2005 when I when I joined the chapter, and uh, and I got a chance to uh, to meet Drew and join my membership, and then I found out that I had several other uh, my friends that I came up with was 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 in the Atlanta chapter, and I didn't know it. Re re reunited. Reunited. Right yeah, we reunited. So in, um, was, was civilian life an adjustment for you? Well, yeah, when I first came out of, out, of the, out of the military, I came back civilian life because in the military, everybody, you know, we work together and, and we work as a team and all. And, and most civilian people, you know, they, they, don't take, they, don't, they, don't, they don't take advantage of, of, of things. You know, they don't, to me, they are, they are, they are, they are not really... Uh, they don't have that 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 that, that coordination that that sh that should be uh, as a work work ethic, that the work ethic part of of the uh, civilian life in the military is what I found out. Uh, people are not realistic about what how they want to they want to do it all, and that was a, that was the biggest part of my idea was getting adjusted to to being in, in an organized organization that you work together and and ethic and all that. And when you come into the civilian, people they just don't 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 uh don't have that, you know they don't have that ability uh, to to work with each other and help one another out and like we did together as a team as a team and being bonded you know and doing things right you know, and I just I guess that's part of training too home training or coming up in life. It, um, and I see your picture of four um, colleagues with you. So do you stay in touch with any of your Yeah, uh, matter of fact, uh, uh we can pick that up and we can, like I said we can put it in the camera. Okay. Matter of fact, uh Harry Hawkins and uh this he's from Titusville, Florida. Hold, hold it up for us. Yeah. See so you can Oh, oh, yeah. oh, yeah. oh, oh, oh. Okay. There we go. Yeah, Harry Hawkins here. Mm -hmm. Uh he's from Titusville, Florida. He worked for at the Kennedy Space Center. He just retired uh, about 2 years ago. He put a uh, 
42 years for the, at the Kennedy Space Center as a technician. And I go down to see him a lot. Uh, and uh, my, fa my wife and I do it. We go to, down to Daytona and we'll call him. He'll come up to Daytona and meet us. And we'll go back to Titusville to visit him. And we've been down, down, to, Tit down to the uh, Space Center a couple of times, you know. He's got a chance to get us in closer. Well, we had a closer shot at the, uh, for, the, for the space lift and all. Mm -hmm. And, who's, who's and the team? other two uh, is uh, Darren and Duval. Duval, he's from St. Petersburg, Florida. The and one that's closest to you? Yes, close, mm -hmm. one close to me. Mm -hmm. And uh, him and I stay, uh, he, he called us, we, we called each other uh, during, like during the summertime, they would come up to Daytona and all. And, uh, and the other, other guy here is uh, Darren. He worked for the, for the fire department here in Atlanta. Okay. He worked for the fire department. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so this picture right here is, wh where are you all? We, we're in New Orleans. Yeah, we're down at the, uh, they call Bell Chase in New Orleans. We, we had a change of command ceremony down there with our uh, 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 squadron commander. And uh, we just taking that picture out on the, on the, fly, on the flight line. Well, and, uh, and this is when the Navy, we, we transferred from the bell bottoms to the chief uniform, what they call it. Yeah, so we went from bell bottoms to white hat to, 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 to the regular uh, 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 chief uniform. So this is a very proud moment. De at that time, yes. Uh -huh. Yes. Okay. And, and this, is, this is during my retirement ceremony. Uh, this is uh, uh, my captain, Jack. He's a Delta Airline pilot. Okay. He's a, he's a Delta Airline pilot. Uh, he's back that time, I think, he was flying the 767 when I was uh, just before I retired. And this is retiring from FAA? Uh, retiring from the Navy Reserve. Navy Reserve, okay. Yeah, retiring from the Navy Reserve. And so what year, when was, when was that? That was in uh, uh, 1989 when I retired from the Navy Reserve. And this is my wife, Betty. That's, that's uh, during my retirement ceremony. They gave her a vote. They call it, in the Navy, they call when you retire, they, they call, call it uh, ship, uh, uh, throwing you overboard. Yeah, they bury you at sea. And... This is going down the plank, they call it, saluting the colors going down the plank. And this is one of my cell uh, 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 of the, of the, of the, of the uh, quarter award that, that I was uh, given with, with uh, Captain DeBojack. And what's that, what was that an award for? Uh, that's been the cell of the quarter. Uh, I had an a outstanding, outstanding cell of the quarter uh, for, for that year. And that was an idea to 100% availability for my squadron. Let's see, and I think, I think this is about all. And uh, that's, I think that's all my Navy pictures. And here's uh, my FAA. This is uh, my, uh, uh, this is our manager here. And uh, this is my 28, 25-year pin from the FAA, federal government. And this is, uh, imagine the name, Mr. Bob Mollock. Mm -hmm. And what year is that? This was uh, in 1989. Uh, it's July 13, 1989. And, uh, and this, this is the, uh, uh, the sale of the quarter award here. Is that good? Uh huh. Eighty one. Nineteen eighty. Nineteen eighty four. Nineteen eighty four. Eighty one. Eighty one. That's that's my rank. That's a, a, a aircraft uh, engine mechanic. And then you have some ribbons and awards. Yeah, and this is and this is uh, when I attended flight engin engineer school at uh, Glenview, uh, Illinois. Is that good? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And this is the group that I finished C-118 school with. Okay. And these are my ribbons. Yeah, I got the Navy uh, uh, ribbon. I got the uh, Meritorious Service uh, uh, Award ribbon. And I got the Armed Forces uh, medal. Well, does it diff do you remember what years or are they different? Uh, they give us a different time uh, in, 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 in uh, well, how, how, how it's set up. You have so many uh, 
uh, years of service. Uh, I think my this year is, a, 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 is, the fo is four years, and this this here is uh, like twelve, and this is something like sixteen that they give you these awards as time goes through. And the same thing along with 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 the with the ribbons. The ribbons are, they have the same same qualification number of years of service. Okay. All right. And what's in the blue? Uh, my my blue case. This is this is uh the the navy called it. This this is uh the history of what I've done in this since I've been in the navy. Yeah, I have a discharge, and they give me uh that when I retire from the reserve they gave me a letter, a, le a letter of a, a com accommodation. Benefits. Benefits and all. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, through that, you no know, retiring out of the Navy Reserve, uh, I put I put 28, 28 years in the Navy Reserve, and this is one of my discharges here. And by that way, it gave me opportunity for my wife and I to 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 to, to use our uh, health care insurance now, and uh, that's that's that was a big big help to have a have health care health care insurance. You know, Tricare Tricare, Tricare for life. Yes, insurance is a is a big big deal for families now. It's a, it's expenses if you don't have a good uh, benefit program at the, on your jobs and so far. Definitely. Well, I'm going to close us out with some questions. All right. And reflections, and it says, um, you know, is it, how were your how did your wartime experiences affect your life? Well, like I said, I was in peacetime during my peacetime for me, but I have friends and all that. Uh, they have had side effects from, you know, being in the Vietnam era. They got Asian orange and, and I, you know, all of that. And I talk to them and I, you know, I just thank God that I went, I wasn't in the combat, but I was in during that era, but I went, I went in the Vietnam, you know, area to, to, uh, to get, uh, to get mixed up with Asian orange. Because I had a friend of mine, he, he lost all his uh, respiratory system. You know, he had to use an oxygen tank just about all his life, you know. And he passed away here several years ago. And I have a cousin now. Uh, he was in also in Vietnam. And he's having a lot of side effects from Asian Orange, and he just started getting his his uh, his benefit from the VA. And like I said, I was I was just blessed and lucky, the good Lord, that I did, I went I went over in the environment. But I was I was in during that era, you know. And I just thank God I didn't have to deal with none of that Asian Orange uh, trauma and stuff, you know, like they did. So what life lessons? Um, have you learned from the military service? Oh, I learned a great, great life lesson from the military. It, it gave me a, a, a big outlook, outlook on life and how to treat people and how to deal with other people of other nationalities and how to delegate responsibility and also how to uh, be a mentor to younger people to, to, to tell them about uh, military life. If you're not going to be able to go to college or uh, when you come out of high school, get your trade school. Uh, get something that you like to do and stick with it, you know, and and uh, and, 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 and and stay focused on what what you're doing, because cause life is 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 is, is just it's a it's a good everybody have a good life if they would if they would treat it that way, you know, you only you only only can be what you want to be, and I should always be the best best of the best, you know, give it a hundred percent. So how has your military service impacted your feeling about war and military in general? Well, you know, as as uh, as, as as this country, you know, we, we are uh, one of the greatest countries and we have to keep it that way. You know, I, I really uh, my president Kennedy, when he was there uh, in, in office during that during that uh, Cuban crisis, I, he stood up for us. And and also after we got our first black president, President, president Obama, you know, he 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 had a lot on the table that he wanted to present, but they wouldn't Congress wouldn't wouldn't uh, wouldn't, 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 uh, wouldn't approve it for him, you know. And he did a great job the eight years he was in, you know. And uh, I, I I respect it. I really like being him being the commander in chief. And uh, I just just hope him and Michelle have a good life, and I hope their children and all do well. And uh, just I'm just hoping as this country we we have to defend this country, you know, because I think we might be headed to another wall. I'm hoping not, but with with uh with the career, I'm kind of looking for things. Things might change because I think they're mad at us because they they you know they separate 
se separate Korea from, from, from North and South, and I think maybe that's what they're mad about now because they, they divided themselves. And uh, I think the leader they have there now, he's, he's really dangerous. And I hope our president don't follow his footsteps and try to uh, intervene and, and try to get another war started. But it don't look too good right now. No, it really. Uh, is there a message, or what message would you like to leave for future generations that might hear this interview? Well, I hope that if if any younger people really uh, probably is hear what I'm what I what I talked about and the way I came up in life and 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 how I got my started with the military, coming out of a land as a young black kid and. Then uh, have you know, my people didn't have a lot of money, you know. We come from a low economical uh, class of uh, individuals, and uh, but it was always taught to do right and respect others, uh, their authority and what they do. And and I just hope the younger generation. That's what I'm really uh, worried about now, the younger generation. And I'm just hoping they can uh, really take heed, uh, you know, the things that I'm saying and and take advantage of all the opportunities that's out there now, because they, they the opportunities out there now are greater. They have all the the, uh, the Hope Ship Scholarship, they have that offer. I didn't, we didn't have that coming up, you know. And, uh, and we, like I said, they just have the opportunity they're letting go by waste. And, and, and they just uh, to take advantage of that. And I hope the parent will support the younger people instead of going to the schools, arguing and fussing and, 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 and listening to their children. They should listen to the, to, the, to, the, to the teachers and the principal, what they have to say. Because that's, that's, where, that's where the battle is won there. They're, they're losing out. If they go down and try to uh, uphold those kids and, and and parents now they 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 really can't be friends of that to to the church. They got to be mothers and fathers. They can't be friends and if their daughters and their fathers can't be friends and stuff with they with the with the with the, with the boys. They got to put themselves in perspective, you know, and and uphold that challenge. And that's what I leave on the table for all the, the younger people to really to to get and, and to, to to keep your mind focused and, and, and find out what you want to do in life and, and be the best of the best and, and stay and stay uh, stay in school and, and get your and education and get your learning. Wonderful. And I um, I'm re recalling as I'm looking at your hat that because you wore your hat that's how we met. I, yes. I came up to you to thank you for your service. And so again, I thank you uh, for your service to the country and for us and for paving the way for for other gener you know, future generations to come. Thank you, Dr. Tape. I thank you for coming in and approaching me that day. <laughs> As I say, we're connected at the hip now, so don't, don't get rid of me. <laughs> All right. Thank you again. All right, thank you.